In 1936, the archaeologist Walter Emery found an ancient mystery. In a first dynasty tomb, he found a peculiar stone object with three thin folded lobes. Was it a tool for making ropes? An impeller? Part of a jet turbine? An anti-gravity device? Let's dig into the evidence and see what holds up. Quick note before we begin. For those unfamiliar with this channel, the thumbnail is tongue-in-cheek. We look for realistic explanations, not sensational claims. As always, we colorize and enhance old photos. If you want to see more videos, please like and subscribe. We'll now describe the object's discovery, adding details that are often omitted. The disc was discovered in 1936 by Walter Emery on the northern edge of the Saqqara necropolis, in tomb number 3111. The tomb belonged to Sabu, an official under King Anajib in Egypt's first dynasty. The tomb's owner is often named as Prince Sabu, but we don't know if Sabu was actually related to the pharaoh. The seals just tell us that Sabu was acquainted with the pharaoh. The tomb architecture follows the early elite pattern. A large rock-cut pit was partitioned by mud-brick walls into the main burial chamber and six other storage rooms. In the burial chamber, Sabu's skeleton lay on its right side, some distance from the center. The disc lay closer to the center, broken up in pieces. What's often omitted in descriptions of the disc's discovery, and which may be relevant, is that Sabu's tomb had been robbed in antiquity. The robbers got in through a hole in the floor of this chamber. It's an interesting parallel to holes dug in the floors of bank vaults during some modern bank robberies. The thieves took all precious metals and valuables. While ripping jewelry off the skeleton, the thieves dislocated Sabu's head and his right arm. Another detail often omitted is a stone platform, about 12 by 8 feet. If its use was ceremonial, it may have had some relation to the disc. By the way, this photo is often shown in this context, without explaining who this man is. This is Zaki Yusuf Saad, at that time the assistant to Walter Emery. Later on, he became an archaeologist in his own right. Let's first make some technical observations. Later on, they'll bear on the plausibility of some theories. The disk of Sabu is carved from a fine-grained, metamorphic stone. It used to be described as schist. Recently, it tends to be classified as metasilt stone. These stone types are related and blend into each other, depending on the metamorphic grade, grain size, etc. Some varieties of metasilt stone are slightly greenish, like the Sabu disc. Metasilt stone is denser and more cohesive than schist, and it can be shaped into thin edges without delaminating. This means that even though the carving of the disc was certainly difficult, metasilt stone does actually allow for unusual shaping. This is why Egyptians used metasilt stone in other art pieces. An interesting aspect is the profile of the three outer ring sections. They're not round in cross-section, as many people think, and as presented in most 3D models. Rather than being a circle, their profile is actually flattened and slanted outward, as seen in these views. This suggests a specific purpose, as if meant to be gripped from outside, as opposed to being a simple structural ring. A similar profile is present on some modern ergonomic steering wheels. We're not suggesting that the Sabu disc is a steering wheel. We're just noticing that this profile occurs when the designer's goal is to match a human hand. Another interesting fact is that the lips of the three concave inlets turn inward at the edge. This suggests a practical purpose, likely the containment of some liquid or granular matter in the bowl to prevent accidental spills. With these observations in place, we can now tackle popular theories Several theories propose some heavy mechanical use of the Sabu disc, such as a turbine, an impeller, etc. Virtually all of such theories can be dismissed, given that thin stone surfaces are too brittle for the forces involved. In physical terms, thin stone surfaces lack toughness, not to be confused with hardness. Unlike metals, stone can't deform under stress, so it breaks up. 
Some theories of this kind call for a long axle, or a rod, to be inserted into the central collar. The problem here is that what you get is a 3-inch thick lever with a huge mechanical advantage focused on the very thin joint between the collar and the bowl. Any side load at the top of the lever would snap off the hub in no time. Similarly, any use involving significant torque would tend to twist off the collar. Another aspect of the collar argues against any serious mechanical use, the grooves carved near the top. Adding ridges here makes no sense if the collar is subject to serious mechanical stress, as all these ridges do is weaken the already thin walls. A group of theories, like impellers or turbines, fall under fluid dynamics, applied to either gases or liquids. In this context, the shape of Sabu's disc has a big problem. To impart a useful direction to a fluid, the blades have to be pitched, that is, at some angle, against the rotation plane. In the Sabu disc, the lobes are parallel to the rotation plane. Thus, all they do is create some pointless local turbulence. Videos of a small Sabu disc creating a vortex in a glass mean nothing, since you can do the same thing with a popsicle stick, a spoon, or an egg beater. You just need to create circular motion in any way you please. Another theory suggests that Sabu's disc was used for making rope or spinning yarn. But wheels for rope making are usually made of metal. They have a hand crank and a few individual spinning hooks. Sabu's disc doesn't look like this. Furthermore, we actually have pictures of how the ancient Egyptians made ropes and yarn. To stretch rope fibers, workers used significant force, which Sabu's disc would be unlikely to withstand. As far as spinning yarn, the spindle whirls were small, about two inches across. Again, nothing like the disc of Sabu. By the way, spindle whirls may date back to pre-dynastic times. This is yet another evidence that the idea of a disc spinning on an axle was known very early in Egypt, even if the wheel for transport was not used. There's a group of theories suggesting a light use involving a fluid, such as a bird bath, a bird feeder, or a fountain. This is actually more plausible than any heavy mechanical or fluid use. However, the design is somewhat awkward for a bird bath. The lobes unnecessarily block about a third of the bathing space. If the three lobes were meant as perches, they're unnecessarily complex. Small narrow walls with rounded tops near the center would be simpler and stronger. If the outer ring sections were meant as a perch, they wouldn't be shaped like a hand grip for humans. They'd simply be round in profile. In cases of lightweight fluid uses, the grooves on the collar could make sense as friction ridges to lock some lightweight part in place. This something, let's call it a topper, could be another bowl or a metal piece, either for bird feed or a vessel with spouts for a fountain, etc. Recall that Sabu's tomb was robbed of valuables. If the topper were made of valuable material, or maybe just very ornamental, it could have been stolen too. For the fountain theory, water could cascade down the lobes, fill the interior bowl, or both, possibly from a topper with spouts. The inward lips argue against a spillover fountain design. Overall, lightweight fluid uses are plausible and they'd explain the showy look, but some design choices seem a bit questionable. Another theory suggests that the Sabu disc was a big oil lamp. Flames would come from burning rush bundles, tucked under the folded lobes. In case you wonder what rush is, it's a plant whose structure allows it to function as a wick. But ancient Egyptian lamps, be they handheld or freestanding, had specific spots for the wick. The Sabu disc has no such spots where one would expect them. The thin edges would likely show burn marks and chipping due to heat, but we don't see it. On porous stone inside the bowl, we'd expect oil discoloration, which we don't see either. Separate bowls for oil lamps in ancient Egypt were made of bronze, clay, or terracotta. We don't know of any other one made of stone. As far as the lack of a stand, we should keep in mind the tomb robbery. If the stand had been made of precious metals or ornamental, it could have been stolen. Some people wonder if there's any symbolic or deeper meaning behind the shape of the Sabu disc. Specifically, in reference to this curious object in the Petri Museum, it shows three upright snakes, each with a third eye on its back, and an open mouth or a tiny bowl in the bottom center. Snakes are very present in Egyptian mythology, 
but we don't know the myth behind this specific object. There are visual similarities to the Sabu disc. Three protruding features, three depressed features, and a central opening. The problem is that threefold symmetry is very common in art everywhere. Finding two objects in this category coincidentally similar is to be expected. The holes in the Sabu disc are symmetrical and go all the way through. In the snake piece, the depressions stop halfway down and they're shaped like curved wedges. If the third eyes are important to the story, there are no equivalents on the Sabu disc. Many people have noticed that the thin surfaces of Sabu's disc appear to mimic the thin walls of metal objects. Indeed, there are other stone objects from that era with thin walls that fit a trend of stone emulating metal. One of the most famous ones in this category is this libation vessel combining the Ankh and Ka hieroglyphs. Some stone workers took this mimicry even further and even emulated metal rivets in stone. It seems that stone workers were trying to outcompete the increasingly more skilled metal workers by creating metal like designs in stone. It's as if stone workers were saying to metal workers, We can do things in stone as thin as your metal objects. Metal wasn't the only material imitated in stone. Egyptian stone workers also replicated rolled up reed mats, wicker work, wood fences, baskets made of palm leaves, and even individual tree leaves. The apparent mimicry of metal objects by Sabu's disc led to other suggestions. Walter Emery and Cyril Aldred proposed that the Sabu disc may be a stone copy of some specific pre-existing metal object. It seems unlikely, and here's why. The form of Sabu's disc is impossible to make from a single sheet of metal, with the standard metalworking technique of cutting and hammering. With a single sheet, you can't have a lip fold over yet simultaneously extend the other way to form a rolled-up tubular section. Spots like this would require assembly from several pieces of metal. The collar would also need to be riveted or soldered to the bowl. Given the technology of the time, to keep mechanical strength, such junctions in metal would result in thick seams. We don't see such seams replicated on the Sabu disc, even though in other cases when a non-stone object is mimicked in stone, we do see details like rivets and accurate wickerwork representation. This implies that the Sabu disc is not a copy of some specific original metal object. Rather, the disc follows the then popular trend of imitating the general appearance of metal objects in stone. Besides mimicking other materials, the Sabu disc fits another trend that persists throughout art history. We can call it a deliberate virtuosity display. That is, creating an artwork whose primary goal is to show off one's technical mastery of the medium. This already starts in ancient Egypt. Some stone workers didn't just mimic thin metal surfaces in stone. They showed off by creating shapes that are very hard to do in stone, like thin lobes folding over themselves. This happened again later on in history. Sculptors going to extreme lengths to create very delicate forms in stone. We're showing only a few examples here, but there are many more. Some time ago, a person named Solenhofen proposed how the disc of Sabu could have been made. We agree with most of this proposal, except the approach to the lobe undercuts. As proposed, the lobes would be created outside first, then hollowed out underneath. The problem here is that the thin lobe may break, as the undercut is being hollowed out in such a tight space. It would be more prudent to leave a thick, protective shell on the outside during hollowing. Then, the inner cavity would be hollowed out, leaving the thick shell in place. A temporary support piece would be inserted under the lobe, made of a substance which is solid, but which can be dissolved. Ancient Egyptians had a few substances that fit the bill. With this support in place, finishing the outer surface of the lobe could now be done without the risk of breaking. Once the lobe was finished, the support could be removed by dissolving in hot water or the like. This approach is similar to modern dissolvable supports in 3D printing. A similar technique could be used in other vessels of this kind. Which side of a thin surface would be worked first would depend on the particular piece. Serious stoneworking skills were also required to make some other objects from that era, though they're not as big as Sabu's disc. One such object was found by the French archaeologist Pierre Monte, 
between 1938 and 1946 in Abu Rawash. Most viewers will associate Abu Rawash with Jedifrey, so let's clarify. This is Jedifrey's Pyramid, 4th Dynasty. This is Cemetery M, 1st Dynasty. This is where this object was found. The central part of this object is lost. Based on the preserved fragment and the attachment points, El Kuli proposes this original shape. But an equally valid interpretation would be a vertical ring in the center, rather than a horizontal disc. Regardless of the exact shape, this object is even less likely than Sabu's disc to have a mechanical function. The thin spokes would break under any force stronger than careful handling by a human. Another object isn't as big as Sabu's disc either, but it's more puzzling. It's a concentric network with subdivisions, likely replicating a sieve or a spider web. Most of the compartments have bottoms. Some, arranged in a pattern, have holes. Oddly, the compartments with bottoms are partially open to each other. Any hypothetical liquid, or a small object, could pass between them. It could be a paint palette or a makeup tray. But why create separate compartments if they're partially open to each other? It could also be a tilting game, similar to modern mazes with small objects. But why include holes which can't be reached? Maybe it was just a tray for small assorted objects, like beads, but the reasoning behind its peculiar design is now lost in time. The Petri Museum has fragments of other complex vessels, but they're too incomplete to reconstruct the whole shape. Now, let's recap. It's unlikely that Sabu's disc served any mechanical function. The brittleness of stone basically excludes any use involving significant forces. It's unlikely that Sabu's disc had anything to do with fluid dynamics, since non-pitched lobes make no sense in this context. It's unlikely that the disc was a copy of a pre-existing metal object. Given the technology of the time, the required assembly in metal would leave visible seams, which we don't see in this alleged replica. It's unlikely that the disc comes from another culture, because it fits in very well with two known trends in Egyptian stonework of that time. One, the mimicry of metal and other materials in stone, possibly to compete with metal workers. Two, deliberate displays of one's technical skills by carving ostentatiously thin surfaces in stone. It's unlikely that the threefold symmetry has a deeper meaning, as lobes in Egyptian vessels of that time come in many numbers. The prominent placement in the tomb suggests the disc was a prized object for Sabu. Besides the show of skill by the artist and the importance to the owner, did the disc have any actual practical function? Possibly, but it was likely a very lightweight use. The inward lips suggest the containment of a liquid or some fine-grained substance in the bowl. Unfortunately for the lovers of mysteries, the most mundane functions are the most likely. Judging from food offerings in elite tombs, Egyptians liked their food well presented. Sabu's disc could possibly be an extravagant table platter, serving dates or other fruit in cold water for freshness to impress the guests. There could potentially be some ceremonial link to the stone platform in Sabu's tomb. Sabu's tomb was robbed, so parts of the disc may be missing if they were valuable or very ornamental. This includes a possible topper or a stand. The disc may have also had a lightweight fluid use, a bird bath, a feeder, or a fountain, even though there are some design questions in this regard. Whatever the function of this disc, its anonymous artist achieved what he very likely desired, a timeless reminder of his existence.